So a couple of years ago, there was this, this, uh, this gentleman that we were at different churches, right? And you would think like in the church world, you know, everybody, like all pastors get along and we were both youth pastors at the time. You just think everybody gets along, right? And we all just love each other and we all get together and pray together. But sometimes, you know, just like in every facet of life, there are people you get along with and people you just don't. And me and this particular gentleman were definitely in the don't category, right? And this guy was a lot bigger than I am. He was a bully. Uh, he was in a church that, you know, um, our church at that time was bigger than their church, and that church always kind of resented it, and we didn't really care, but they did for some reason. Now that church is bigger than that church, and, you know, I don't know, just the whole thing. And, and so this particular gentleman was just always kind of, you know, that person with me. And uh, on one particular day, on one particular day, he and I and two other youth pastors, we had taken the day and we'd gone down to New York City and we're just spending the, you know, just a couple of youth pastors spending the day together. And uh, in the middle of this whole thing, we're sitting at a restaurant and he makes this like outlandish um, accusation about me. Like it was just completely out of, you know, just, it was just, and he gets up and he walks away. And the other two guys just looked at me, and we just started laughing. Like, it was just so ridiculous that he would make this kind of a statement about me. And, you know, you ever have anything like that ever happen in your life, and you're just like, you know, God, strike them. <laughs> Has anybody, am I the only, like, totally honest person in this room, right? Anybody else? I'm giving you a chance. Come on. It's an altar call right now, right? And, and so fast forward. A couple years later, he leaves that church, goes to another church, and it's found out that he's having an inappropriate relationship with another woman. His marriage is tanked. He loses his position. And eventually, he and his wife reconciled, so on and so forth. What do you think my response is to that? What should my response be to that situation? Yes, right? Isn't that? But you know, it wasn't satisfying. It, it didn't make me feel any better that he had gotten what he deserved. God's restored him and his relationship with his wife and all those kind of things, and I thank God for that. But I want to talk to you today about envy. Envy. I specifically want to talk about our desire, our desire that God would take care of all the bad people in the world. David talks about this in Psalm chapter 37. We're going to look at Psalm chapter 37. If you don't have a piece of note paper, we'd be glad to get that to you in a pen. If you like to follow along in your Bible, I use the New Living Translation. Um, so if you use something else, you're probably going to be lost, but that's all right too. Um, but Psalm 37, I think, is such an important uh, verse for us because we all deal with these kind of feelings from time to time. So look at what he starts out with. David starts off with a really, really kind of uh, he starts this psalm off with a bang, I guess I would say. And he says this, don't worry about the wicked. Now look at this next line. Or envy those who do wrong. Now if you're like me, you look at that and you go, envy those who do wrong? I mean, I don't envy people who do wrong. I don't, that's, that's kind of a weird statement. Envy people who do wrong. Wrong. You know, envy, envy is an insidious and it's a really powerful emotion, right? It's no wonder that Solomon added envy to his list of deadly sins because envy will eat you alive spiritually, emotionally, and relationally, right? Do you remember the song? Do you remember the song? If you're old enough, do you remember the song, Jesse's Girl? right? I wish that I had Jesse's girl. I, you know, like this guy was so busy envying Jesse that he was probably missing really good relationship possibilities all around him, right? Or, or anybody here old enough to remember the show MTV 
cribs. <laughs> old people up in here, right? Now, if you're really old, you remember lifestyles of the rich and famous. There's a bunch of kids in this room like, what? Right? Today, you call it the Kardashians. Okay? <laughs> Right? And, and we had this ability to look in to how the other half lives. But if we're all honest, by the time you got to the end of that show, you always kind of felt like or ended up feeling like what you have isn't enough. And that's called envy. And, and we envy some of the craziest things too, don't we? Right? We envy better weather. Especially now, like when it starts getting cold, all I do, you know, I could just spend all day just looking at palm trees, pictures of palm trees and people who are out on the beach, right? We envy better weather. And we envy bigger muscles. Man, if I just had arms like Dean, right? If I just, like we envy bigger muscles. We envy a better job. If I just, you know, if I just had a better job, right? Some of us, if we're honest, come on, we envy smarter kids, right? Nobody said anything. It got real quiet in here, right? <laughs> and when we were kids, when we were kids, like if you were a second, third, fourth, fifth, right, you envied your older siblings because they could stay up later. Remember that march back to your room when you were kind of like, oh, my goodness, she gets to stay up right? Did anybody besides me like sit at the door in your bedroom and listen to what you thought was going on out in the living room because your older sibling got to stay up later than you, right? David says that we even envy those who get away with evil. David says that we even envy people who get away with doing the wrong things. He calls them wicked people, right? And I can kind of relate to that. It, it, it's sort of a different way. I, I don't think these people were wicked. I don't think they're evil. But for me, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was a pastor. And we grew up in that 80s Christian time. It was definitely different than it is now. And, and I wasn't allowed to do certain things. I wasn't allowed to go to school dances, right? And, and if you've ever seen me dance, it was a good thing. I probably saved myself a whole lot of angst and, and future therapy for not going anyways. But I wasn't allowed to go to Christian uh, or to school dances. And I also, I wasn't allowed to go to parties. You know those Friday night parties that all the other kids went to? I wasn't allowed to go to those. And I'll be honest with you, growing up, I resented it. I envied those who were able to go and do it because it bothered me that I wasn't able to join in all the fun, right? Now, let's fast forward. As adults, we kind of do the same thing, don't we? But it looks more like this. We envy people, right? We envy people who get away with tax evasion. Why can't I evade my taxes and get away with it, right? Or, or how about this? She just got a new husband. Where's mine? <laughs> right? Those people, they cut corners and they still get promoted. And we say something like this, where's the justice, right? And here's the truth of the matter. It can feel like doing the right thing is really prohibitive to fun, to advancement. And here's David's advice to us in your notes. He says, don't worry about wicked people. Don't worry about wicked people. Here's what David's saying. In other words, he's saying, keep your head down and you worry about you. Just worry about yourself. And, and let's be honest. Come on. If we're just being honest here today, and that's what we do on Sunday mornings. We don't any other day. We just do it on Sunday mornings. If we're being honest, we got enough to worry about on our own, don't we? I mean, like, if we just took care of our, our backyard, if we just took care of our problems, if we just took care of us, that's, that's, if we're really honest about it, that's quite enough for us. So here's what David does. In the second verse, he gives us a quick answer to our problem with envy. Let's take a look at this. He says this, For like grass, they, those wicked people, or those people who, who do the wrong thing, 
right? Those people, they will soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Here's what David's saying. He's reminding us, here's what David says, life is short. Life is short. The older you get, the more you know that, don't you? He says, life is short. And he says this, eternity is longer. Life is short, but eternity is longer. Now, even if you're here, if you're here, even if you don't believe in God, maybe you're here and you're like, okay, Pastor Paul, just checking it out, just seeing what the church, we're glad to have you, we're so glad you're here this morning. And you say, but you know, the whole God thing, I'm not sure if I'm there yet. But even if you don't believe in God, you can agree, right, that the people and the things you envy will one day be a memory, right? See, I matured, and I realized as I matured, I realized that the parties that I missed, they weren't that epic, right? And the kids that I envied all the way back in high school or years ago, right? Those are the same people that now put all kinds of messages on my Facebook about how they envy my marriage, right? They envy the fact that I have good, well-adjusted kids. See, what it seemed important to me once upon a time is no longer important. It no longer has value in my life. See, what has lasted is my marriage and my good relationship with my children and their spouses. And most of all, you know what's lasted? My integrity. My integrity, right? See, I don't lay my head on my pillow at night with a whole bunch of regrets because I've done the right things. I don't worry about the IRS coming to get me, right? And I'm not consumed with a bunch of regrets and what ifs. So let me ask you this morning, let me ask you this question. Maybe you write this down in your notes. What do you envy? What do you envy? Because like grass, soon it'll fade away. And like the spring flowers, they will soon wither. And maybe you envy the fact that they seem to get away with doing wicked things. And that they get promoted and appear to win at every turn. But here's what I want you to catch this morning. That's going to pass. See, they have to live with themselves, constantly covering their tracks. They have to keep their story straight. They have to remember the facts. And here's what David's saying. He's saying that life eventually catches up with you. And you know what else? He says that God keeps good records. Let me say that again. God keeps good good records. So look at this. Look at the next step David advises us in verse 3. He says this, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord, and do good. Can I tell you, what a great message to say to your kids every morning. Wouldn't that be a great thing just to say to your kids every morning when you get done praying over them or you get done giving them their, I was going to say oatmeal, but let's be honest, you give them fruit loops because <laughs> you're good parents, right? Send them off with those fruit loops right? Trust in the Lord and do good. Because look what happens. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. See, there's if-then promises in the Bible. If you trust in the Lord and do good, then you will live safely in the land and prosper. It's an if-then promise in Scripture. And here's what David's saying. He says, you do you and let God take care of the rest. Can you say that with me? Ready? You do you and let God take care of the rest. Let's do it one more time. You do you and let God take care. Now let's make it personal. You ready? Me do me. We'll just bad English here, right? Okay. Me do me and let God take care of the rest. Trust in the Lord. See, this whole thread comes down to this. Do I trust, do I trust that God is good? Do I trust that God is good? And maybe you're here and you don't. Maybe somewhere along the line you prayed and God didn't answer 
the prayer the way you wanted them to answer it. Maybe there, was, maybe there was a time that you were hurt and you felt like God let you down. Maybe you're here this morning and you're carrying around a burden and, and that's a hard statement for you, that God is good. Or maybe you're here and you feel like, hey, hey, that's great. Okay, Pastor Paul, whatever, you know, talk about integrity. Blah, blah, blah. But come on, I found that cutting corners and cheating to get ahead is the best route for my life. You know, maybe you're just here and you're like, yep, that's the person I am and that's worked for me and, and that's been good for me up to this point and, and I'm good with that and I'm willing to just stick with that, right? And you're, you're, you're here and you're just like, ah, I, I don't know about this whole thing. Mikey, I need you to go, thank you, right? And I want you to know, I'm not telling you what to do this morning. I'm not telling you how to live your life. That's not my, that's not my whole gig this morning. I'm hoping to provoke your thought this morning. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, right, if that's who you are, you you cut corners and you're, you know, I'll step on people and cheat and whatever I have to do to get ahead, and that may be you. But doesn't it seem just easier and simpler to do the right thing? At the end of the day, isn't that just an easier, simpler life? Living an honest life, just doing my work, seems easier to me. Now, even if you don't believe in God, right, and I don't think you can argue with the second part of, the ver- of this verse, then if I just do what I'm supposed to do, if I just do the right thing, right, then I can live safely and prosper. See, the honest life, doing the right thing in every situation, it may not be glamorous, but you know what it is? It's safe. It's safe. Honest people, you know what honest people don't do? They don't look over their shoulders. There's nobody coming after them, right? Honest people, they aren't in constant litigation. Like if you're in and out of litigation all the time, maybe you want to take a look at your life, right? They don't have to justify their actions because everybody knows that they live in integrity. Everybody knows that they do the right thing. See, they're dependable. And they're called in times of crisis because people know that they can depend on them. And you know what else honest people get to do? Honest people get to keep what they earn. So here's David's second piece of advice this morning. You ready? Trust that God will take care of you. See, because at the end of the day, that's what cutting the corners, and that's what doing it my own way, and that's what, you know, kind of cheating and finagling my way to get there, at the end of the day, what I'm really saying is God can't take care of me, and that I have to find some way to do it myself. See, that means that we do the right thing even when it isn't immediately rewarding. And here's what I want you to get today. Here's what I want you to get today. We can depend on God. We can depend on God because God always does what is right. We can depend on God because God always does what is right. So David tackles another important lesson for us in verse 4. He says this. You ready? He says, take delight. Everybody say, take delight. Take delight. Take delight. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Now, if there's ever been a scripture that's been misused... This is, circle it, underline it, put red around it, highlight it, take a picture of it, send it to all your Facebook friends, Instagram, right? If there's ever been a scripture that has been taken out of context, this is it, right? Listen to me. Read the first part of this verse. Ready? Let's read it together. Take delight in the Lord. Let's try it again. You ready? Ready? Take delight in the Lord. That's the key to this verse. Everybody jumps down to the second part, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Woo! Right? The whole prosperity gospel is built on that right there, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. But the problem with that is, what are the desires of your heart? Take delight in the Lord. See, this is a big antidote to envy. 
When you find your ultimate joy from your relationship with your heavenly Father, then, then you will be satisfied. See, ultimately what we really are looking for is a satisfied life, isn't it? What we're really looking for is to get to that place where we go, (sighs) and that's exactly what envy steals from us. It steals satisfaction. I want that house. I want that car. I want that boat. I want to be able to do wicked things and get away with it. I want this. I want, right? That's what envy steals away from us. Envy steals away satisfaction. And here's what David says. He says, when you delight yourself in the Lord, when he is your point of satisfaction, right? You won't need anything else. Then, listen, then God can give you other things because you're going to have the right perspective on them. When you find your ultimate delight and you find your ultimate joy in God, in your relationship with your heavenly Father, then you will find the secret to the satisfied life. See, if my joy is in stuff, I'm never going to have enough. And if my joy is in earthly relationships, I'm going to be disappointed. You want to know why? Because people disappoint you. Right? You know that. And if my joy is in advancement, right, I'm going to find out one of two things. First of all, I'm either going to find out that there's only so far I can advance. And no matter what I do, I hit a ceiling. Or... I'm going to advance to that place that I've always wanted to be, and I'm going to find the old axiom is true. It is lonely at the top. So advancement doesn't bring satisfaction either, right? But when a rich, satisfying relationship with my Heavenly Father is my desire, I will always be satisfied. And my desire for joy is going to be fulfilled. That's what David's saying. Delight yourself in the Lord. See, God's endless. Here's what I want you to see this morning, that God is endless and that we will enjoy him forever. You're never going to get bored of God. Some people think, oh, we're going to get to heaven, we're going to sit on clouds, we're going to be bored. You're never going to be bored with God because God's endless, right? He just goes on forever and ever and ever. We're going to constantly learn new things about him. We're going to constantly grow in relationship with him. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks a question and then it answers it. It says this, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Those who find that the light in the Lord are constantly satisfied. Isn't that great news this morning? Verse 5. You ready? You with me? Okay, so at the very top, you see DTCB, right? So that's what we're working from. Does anybody remember what D was? Don't worry. Okay, right? So T is trust. Very good. C is commit. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. Verse 6 says this, he will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Mm. God keeps good records. Let me say that again. God keeps good records. Commit's an interesting word here, right? The Hebrew for commit is to roll. Everybody say roll. Right? We're going to roll together this morning, right? Okay. And what that is, it means to roll off a burden. To roll off a burden, right? Roll everything you do to the Lord. So I need some help here. So I'm going to ask Glory, because Glory is small. Perfect size for Glory, though, okay? And Dean. I need Dean to come and help me out, right? I'm going to have Dean stand here. I need Glory to come up here because if she tries to roll this up, it's not going to go as well, right? Dean, he benches like 587 pounds. Come on up here, Glory, please. Okay? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to roll this over to Dean. You ready? Wow. Pretty amazing. Come on, give her a hand. One more time. 
<laughs> Thank you, right? Now, my point in that is some of us, we feel like glory. Like, oh, my goodness, the burden is bigger than me. God's saying, I'm big enough to handle your burden. I'm big enough to handle your situation. Why don't you quit holding on to it? Here's what we do. We walk around with our burdens. No, honestly, it's what we do. What's up? Oh, this? Well, I'm working at it. <laughs> totally got it under control. This thing, you know, I've gotten used to it. We're old pals. Sleeping kind of stinks. Huh? How many of you are losing sleep over your burdens? Yeah, it's kind of consuming my life. I can't, go ahead, stand up for me, Rich. I can't get as close to people as I want to. Come on, give me a hug, man. Right? My burden, my problem, my situation, it's consuming my life. God says, why don't you just roll it on over to me. Thanks, Rich. Why don't you just roll that burden on over to me. That, that's just a 10-pound burden. Some of you, you're carrying big burdens, right? And God's saying, why don't you come on and roll it over to me? What if, what if we got up every morning and we rolled everything over to God? This morning, I'm going to roll my calendar over to you, God. Everything of my day, I'm giving it to you. This morning, I'm going to roll my family over to you. God, you know what? I can't handle. I can't do it. I've tried. I've done everything I can. And everything I do just keeps pushing us farther and farther away. God, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to roll my finances over to you. How about this one, right? God, I'm just going to roll the government over to you. I'm going to stop blogging about it and uh, Instagramming about it and Facebooking about it. How about I just, you can have it, <laughs> right? I'm going to roll my husband. I'm going to roll my wife. I'm going to roll my kids. I'll just roll it over to you, God. And here's what we do, though. We roll it over, right? Roll it back over. And you, some of you, you don't even get out of the parking lot before you're like, oh, yeah, Okay. Right? You're already back on the phone. You're not even out. You're literally not out of the parking lot. And you're right back on the phone dealing with your problem, your situation. Your God's going, no, 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 no. Sorry, Rich. You got the front row, buddy. <laughs> Just roll it over to me. Isn't this better? Like, see ya. <laughs> right? I know that's hard. Right? Thanks. But you know what? The point of this is that we're saying, God, I trust you. God, I trust you with, you fill in the blank. God, I trust you with, let him have it. And guess what happens? Guess what happens? God shines the light on your cause. God shines the light on your cause. God says, okay, I got it now. Let's handle this. So, why does it appear as though the wicked prosper? See, God's saying this. They aren't really prospering because they have to hustle with their own energy and cunning to succeed. And God says this to us. He says, I'll make you succeed in the areas that matter if you'll roll all of it over to me. But here's what that means in your notes this morning. It means that we have to commit everything to the Lord. So just below that or beside it, put roll it. Roll it over to God. Roll it over to God and he will help you. And here's what he's going to do. He's going to shine his light on your honest work. He's going to shine his light on your diligence. God's going to shine his light on your integrity. And it may not be in the time that you want it. But can I tell you something this morning? It's coming. Because what you've done is not done in secret. And your good deeds 
and your honesty and your diligence and your hard work and your integrity and your trust in God, it will be recognized. The last portion of this is really applicable to a lot of us. And the verse right after this, can I tell you, go home and read verse 8, okay? Because verse 8 talks about anger. I decided not to go to verse 8 this morning. That, that's a whole sermon by itself, okay? But verse 7 says this, be still. Be still. Now, probably half of us just went, And the other half of us just tensed up, right? Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait. What's that word? Oh, you got to say it with a little more enthusiasm than that. And wait. Wait patiently for him to act. Don't what? Don't worry. Don't worry about evil people who prosper and fret about their wicked schemes. Some of you, you read that and you go, be still, wait patiently, don't worry. You're like, what? <laughs> Seriously? That's your advice? That's your advice. Like, Pastor Paul, you don't know the situation I'm in. Pastor Paul, you don't understand how deep it is. Pastor Paul, you, Pastor Paul, don't be, st- what? Like, that's the worst advice, everything. That goes against everything that my emotions are telling me. Right? You don't know the squirrels that are running around in my head at 2 a.m. I take more anxiety. No, okay. Right? Goes against everything. And where everything in us says, I want to act now. I want to get justice. I want others to see their sins. Right? I need to call in backup. I need to expose that person or that situation for who they really are. But look at what David does for us. David explains for us, David explains what it means to delight oneself in the Lord. You ready? To delight oneself in the Lord, it means that we commit our way to him and truly trust him. That's what it means to delight yourself in the Lord. To commit your way to him and trust him that he's going to get you where you need to go. It means that we find peace. It means that we find protection. It means that we find satisfaction in a surrendered life to God. It literally means to let him be in control and to give over the control of our worry and our doing to God. To the God who already, think about this, All we're doing is we're already giving over to God what God already holds in his hand because God already holds all of it in his hand anyways. What makes us think that we can hold on to it? What makes us think that we can control it? God's got it all in his hand anyways. All he's looking for is our surrender and our trust. And that means we have to just give it up, relax, and let God handle it in your notes. Be still and don't worry. Right? That is the easiest, hardest advice in in the world, isn't it? It's like the easiest, hardest thing to do. Be still, don't worry. Right? If I were to close right now, say, okay, I want everybody to close your eyes, bow your head. How many of you commit that you're going to be still? And you go, yes. Okay, and you commit this morning that you're not going to worry. You're like, yes. Right? And I go, amen. And you go, whew. Well, I got da da da. Sounds easy on one hand, but the practical application of it, the practical application of giving up is the hardest thing to do. And for some of us, it may feel like we're being vulnerable and weak, but it's actually the strongest thing that you and I can do. But that's hard. It's hard for us, right? So what's the secret? Paul, David gives us the secret. You ready? The secret is to be still in God's presence. In your notes, to trust God more, if you want to trust God more, 
you have to spend more time with him. If you want to trust God more, you have to spend more time with him. Let's be honest. Some of us in this room, we like, I, I just, I can't, I just, I can't trust God. I just can't trust God. And all I would have to, I, it wouldn't take me three seconds to figure out what the problem is. How much time do you spend with him? Well, you know, Pastor Paul, I get up in the morning, I got stuff to do. I mean, I got to watch Fox News, right? I got to feed the kids. I got to, 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 I just, I don't have time. But I don't know why. I just can't seem to trust God. I don't know why I keep taking this back. I roll it over to him, and then I take it back. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with it. You, you want to know why? Because you don't spend time with him. Don't spend time with him. You want to trust God more, you have to spend more time with him. And when we're still every day in his presence, we're going to trust him more. And guess what's going to happen when we trust God more? You ready? We will Relax. You ever notice people who have really big spiritual faith? They just seem like, right? Yeah, just found out I have cancer. It's good. Why? Because I trust God. Just found out, you know, we just lost some money. You freaking out? Nah. It's good. Remember Daniel in the Bible? Hey, we're going to throw, anyone who, who prays to anyone besides God gets thrown in the lion's den. David's like, hey, that's a good rule. I'm going to go pray now. Because you know what? I can make it in the lion's den because I've spent time with God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if our God doesn't come through, we know that he's able to save us. Why? Because we spend time with every day. We spend time in his presence. We're just still. Not just still, you know. We're not just meditating. We're not putting on the, the Alexa meditation music, right? No. I'm spending time being still God's presence. I'm getting to know him because the more I know him, the more I trust him. The more I trust him, the more he can shine his light in my life. The more I trust him, the more I can roll over to him. The more I roll over to him, the more I can relax. The more I can relax, ah, the better life is. This is the satisfying life. See, you and I, we can get caught up in the envy trap, right? Why don't I get to? Why don't I get to? Why don't I get to? Why don't I get to this? Why don't I get to that? Why? Right? Sometimes doing the right things can seem boring. And like we're held to a higher standard just to be punished for it. But here's what I want you to get this morning. You ready? We can, de we can depend on God because God always does what is right. God's going to show up. God's going to take care of. God's going to provide. God always does what is right. And those people who appear like they're getting away with it, they're being watched by God, and God doesn't miss a thing. So can I give you some advice? Just relax and let God handle it, right? Those people who hurt you are being monitored by God, and they're going to be judged by God. So you and I, right, we just do us. Just do you. Put your head down. Stop whining on Facebook and Instagram, right, and Twitter, and let God take up your cause, cause because God keeps perfect records, and he's the only one who's the perfect judge this morning. So I want to give you some practical but difficult application today. At the bottom of your notes, if you didn't get notes, grab notes at least for this this morning. Here's what I want you to do, okay? First of all, just a simple application of this right? D-T-C-B. Everybody say that with me. D-T-C-B, right? Don't worry. Trust in the Lord. Commit or roll everything over to the Lord and be still in his presence. You got to add that. Be still in his presence. Each of these are actions, None of them are passive. They're all actions. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a notebook. If you don't already have a journal, 
I want you to journal with me for one week. I want you to get a notebook, and I want you to journal every day this week. And I want you to ask yourself these questions. How am I going to, and they're in your notes, give my worries to God? For that day, be specific. Today, God, I'm giving you, write down what your worries are. Just write them down, okay? Today, God, I'm going to look at the areas that I need to trust you. What areas do I need to trust the Lord for today? Just for that day. That day, right? Give your worries to God. Be specific. What areas am I going to trust you? What worries, excuses, abuses, and offenses do I need to roll over to God today? And then, then here's the last thing. I want you to take five minutes. Five minutes. And just be still. God's presence. And then write down a couple of thoughts about that after that five minutes or even during that five minutes. Whatever God may be laying on your heart. And see, see, if you don't see a demonstrative difference in your life this week. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that maybe, maybe they're having a hard time even just thinking about that. Because they want to control it so bad. They're, they're convinced that they can work this out and make it go the way they want it to go. Maybe they're convinced this morning that you don't care. Would you show yourself, would you show yourself strong in their life? Lord, I pray that every person in the sound of my voice would take action this week. Because we all worry about stuff. We all do this. But Lord, what we're really Deep down, what we desire is a rich and satisfying life. And that's found in you. And that's found when we commit everything to you and trust you and just relax in your presence. So God, I pray specifically for those that this is especially hard for today. I pray that they would step up. Step up. And Lord, that you would do exactly what you promised to do, that you would show yourself faithful in their life. For those of us who are carrying around big burdens today, you're the way maker. You take our burdens, Lord. You say that we can exchange our burdens, which are heavy, and take on your burdens, which are light. I pray for anyone who's struggling with that today, that they would just roll it over to you, and that you have it, that they would trust you, because you're good, and you always do what is right. Bless your people as we leave this place today. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We love you.